Amen, amen, and you may be seated. A couple of things I didn't forget to mention. One, uh, we're going to be giving the right hand of fellowship to those that uh, have asked to join the church. Uh, I want you to understand you don't have to be a member of this church to fellowship with this church, but you do have to be involved in membership if you want to be involved in leadership or you feel like God has placed you here to do something in the way of ministry. And so uh, we have several applications already in. I will announce next Sunday when we're going to give the right hand of fellowship to give everybody that opportunity. I've also been asked about water baptism. If you would like to be water baptized, please put your name, date of birth, and a phone number so I can contact you and just drop it in the offering plate or hand it to an usher and we will be glad to uh, set the water baptism of service up. And having said all of that, when I am elected, I promise. <laughs> to make Azel a better, <laughs> amen. To make Azel great again, hallelujah, oh boy. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. I do appreciate the song list this morning. I looked at that and I thought it's just so much. Uh, it's just the right thing at the right time. And so my message this morning has a patriotic connection to it. I'm going to be asking you three questions. So my message this morning is the United States a Christian nation? Is the United States a Christian nation. Turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. I want to read a conversation between Jesus and his disciples concerning end times. And then I want to read to you from Psalm the promises of God concerning the hour that we're living in. Matthew chapter 24 verse 1. When Jesus went out and departed from the temple, his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. He said to them, Do you not see all these things? But surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. In less than thirty years, everything there was thrown down, torn down. The Romans actually pulled stone from stone to pull out any gold or precious metal that might have been there. Verse 3. As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? And of the end of the age. And what I begin to read with verse 4 going into verse 9 is actually an explanation of Revelation chapter 6. In Revelation chapter 6, opening up, it talks about the red horse, the black horse, the white horse, the pale horse. And in Revelation it's described as the end time events with the Antichrist, the great tribulation. But in the meantime, there is a spirit of application, which means there's things like that going on right now. And so I begin with verse 4, which has to do with the spirit of Antichrist, the white horse. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceive you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Then the red horse in verse 6 and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. See, we see the shadows of all these things now. Verse 7, we have the black horse. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of trouble. Verse 9 is the pale horse, the persecution and death horse. 
Then they would deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, will hate one another. And then many false prophets will rise up, deceiving many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures, endures to the end, shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, all people. Then the end will come. Now, I have to, I, I have to tell you this. Every time I read that, I, can make, I make several applications. One is historical, one is prophetic, and the other one is personal. How does this apply to me? How does it apply to the church? And I see the parallel between the nation of Israel and the, and the body of Christ. As goes the church, so goes the nation of Israel, and vice versa. As goes the nation of Israel, so goes the church. And this has been the case for the last 2,000 years, and it's still that way today. But I want to show you one other thing. Go with me to Psalms 46. Psalms 46, verse 1. God is our source. Now, your Bible may say refuge. God is our source and our strength. A very present help in trouble. A very present help. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. Everybody say Emmanuel. Amen. Look at your name and say God's with us. God's with us. Amen. Verse 2. Well, I'm going to read verse 1 again. God is our source and our strength. Emmanuel, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not be uptight, stressed, or fearful. Though the earth be moved, removed, though the mountain be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters roar and be troubled, though the mountain shake with its swelling. Stop and think about this, sailor. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God or the people of God. The holy place of the tabernacle of the most high. How many of you know that holy place tabernacle is you and me today? It's not a building. Amen? Amen. God is with us. Verse 5, God is in the midst of her, Emmanuel. And she, the church, the body of Christ, shall not be shaken up, moved. God will help the church just at the break of dawn. The nations raised, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, Emmanuel. The God of Jacob, deliverance is our refuge and strength. Amen. Stop and think about it. Selah. Verse 10. Be still. Settle down. Take a deep breath. Relax. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Emmanuel, the Lord of hosts, is with us. The God of Jacob, deliverance, is our strength. I have had a most interesting month. In all my ministry, in all my time in Azel, I've never had so many different people out of my past calling and texting and asking questions. Pastor, what does all of this mean? Basically, they're asking me five questions. And one of the interesting things is this. There is a retired Episcopal priest that has called me now. He said, I just want to be able to communicate with you about what's going on. So I've agreed to talk to him. 
I don't know what all of this is leading up to, but I will tell you what the five questions are for the most part. Number one, and I mentioned that in my title, and this is my first question of the day. I'm going to be asking you three questions. But the questions that are asked in me, is the United States a Christian nation? The second question they're asked in me, as a nation, are we in Bible prophecy? The third question they're asked in, what is the future for the United States? The fourth question they're asked in me, will the end of the world be anything like the books and the movies? And the last question, and it really hit me hard when the brother said this to me, and I probably had not been in touch with him in over 10 years. He said, Pastor, can you tell me if I'm ready? And so I asked the question today, are we ready? Amen. Last Sunday, I preached this message that God has uh, chosen and positioned us be ready. And so today, the question is going to be, am I ready? And so I ask you this, is our nation being defined in Bible prophecy first? In Bible prophecy, the answer has to be an emphatic yes. But here's what I want you to understand. In Matthew chapter 24, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked a specific question, several questions in fact. What's the end going to be like? Is this the end and everything? Uh, when Jesus got ready to go back to heaven, just before he ascended, they asked this question, are you going to establish your kingdom now? He said, it's not for you to know the day and the hour, but we find in other places that we can know the times and the seasons. And so when we see certain things happening, we know this is spring, we know this is fall, summer, winter, whatever the case may be. So when we see these things happening, we know that summer is near. We see these things happening, we know we're about to have a real hot, dry summer right now. Everything tells us the seasons that are around us. How many of you can honestly tell me that you sense something inside of you of concern and alert as to what's going on in the world, in our nation, and in our churches? Can you raise your hand and say, I see that? I, see that. I want you to know that God is stirring up the body of Christ. He's stirring three generations. He's stirring the old folk, the young folk, and the kids. And I want to tell you something. The kids are going to teach us how to worship. The young folk are going to get us fired up. And we, <clears throat> others, <laughs> we're going to be the prayer warriors that surround the body of Christ to bring in a total victory. Get ready for a victory. I love the song this morning. Uh, uh, they did a, you got, Johnny, you did a great job on the song. That's all I got to say about that. You did a great job. Yes. Hallelujah. Now, the thing, the thing is this. Timothy was told by Paul, he said, perilous times shall come. And in talking about perilous times shall come, he talked about people departing from the faith. He talked about the breakdown of family values. He talked about perversions. He talked about rebellion. He talked about riot. He talked about rumors of wars. He talked about earthquake. He talked to, everything that he mentioned is what's going on right now. But Jesus said this, when you see these things, know the end is near. That's not the end. In other words, right now, as I stand here talking to you, there is an asteroid the size of the Egyptian pyramids passing between earth and the moon how close to earth or how close to the moon is pure speculation they're still trying to get it on the computer as to what's what but what would happen if that thing all of a sudden because of gravitational pull or because of a solar flare or because of one of our crazy satellites up there that thing just decided to take a turn to the right or to the left and hit one of those bodies the moon or the earth what would be our day tomorrow we're so close, that close, to everything in our lives changing in a moment's time. Everything was going fine one day, and all of a sudden I get a phone call. My wife had been in a car wreck. That changed my life. 
And for a moment, everything went on hold, the schedules were changed, appointments were canceled, everything else went to the side because the priority was to make sure my wife was all right. I got news for you. We had a debate, political, and I'm not here to make a political speech, promise you that, okay? But in our debate last Thursday, we saw America is in trouble. How are we going to fix it? We cannot fix it, but he has already given us the victory as the song says. Victory is in our heart, victory is in our lives, and victory is in America. Is America in Bible prophecy? Absolutely America is in Bible prophecy. America is one of the young lions, but I have to tell you this, that the reason America exists today is because Israel did not do her job and God raised us up Gentiles to get the gospel message out to the entire world. Something good coming down the pipe because we represent the body of Christ and every one of us, thank you, I appreciate that. I tell you, I battled with this. I rewrote my notes about three or four times to try to get in here and make this thing work. And after I did Wednesday night with, I mean, with the Rebe book of Revelation, I thought, I've got to be nice this morning. So I'm trying my best to tell you something folk we are on the threshold of some major changes it's going to happen in our church it's going to happen in our nation it's going to happen in us personally I'm excited about it okay when you see these things coming to pass lift up your head your redemption draws nigh lifting up your head means doesn't mean watching the sky it means oh, oh become alert become awake oh this is what's going on yes I'm on target here Folk, understand, please understand, this is the way it's supposed to be. Amen. Hello. This is the way it's supposed to be. Now, I mention all these perilous things. There's two sides to the coin. Turn it over and look at the other side. And you will find it illustrated in the book of Ruth. Ruth's husband died. Ruth was living in a pagan land, in the land of the Gentiles. And she said, it's time for me to go home. And she had two daughter-in-laws who had lost their husbands. And these two daughter-in-laws are Gentiles. They're not Jewish. One of them decided to stay with the Gentile family. But Naomi said to Ruth, where you go, I go. And your God will be my God. And so a Gentile woman followed a Jewish woman back to Israel. And when Naomi arrived at Ruth's old homestead. There she was, with no family. And being a Gentile, she was a nobody. But her mother-in-law, Ruth, said, this show is not over. There is a man here who is married, who is the brother of your husband next to kin of your husband and our law and our custom is this he's supposed to take up for you so Naomi is out in the field am I getting his name back Ruth is in the field. Naomi is the mother-in-law. I, I saw all you people talking back and forth, and I thought, I'm doing something wrong here. And, I had, and it took me a moment to realize what it was. Naomi is the mother, and Ruth is the Gentile. All right. <laughs> oh, boy. Mm -mm -mm. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the good part about that is I saw half of you really know the Bible. <laughs> Everybody was going back. I said, I'm doing something wrong. It took me a moment to re realize what I had said. But Ruth is in the field, and along come Boaz. 
and Boaz took a liking to Ruth. I could preach the entire sermon just on the relationship and how it's a type of Christ in the church, but that's not my point. My point is this. Boaz is a type of Jesus. Ruth is a type of the church, the Gentiles. And because the nation of Israel had gone out into the Gentile world, God is bringing her back with Naomi coming home. Israel is coming back to God, folk. There's wars going on over there. There's a lot of strife going on over there. There's a lot of trouble in the Middle East. Long story short, Israel is coming back to God. But in the meantime, Jesus is going to marry his spiritual Ruth. He's going to marry the church. And I want you to know that before that wedding took place, he was already blessing Ruth. I got news for you. We're not at the marriage supper of the Lamb yet, but God is already blessing the church. And you're going to see more and more blessings flowing this way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. There will be individual blessings as well as collective blessings, but get ready to be blessed. Keep in mind this, that God delivered those who followed Noah into the ark. God delivered those who followed Lot out of the city. And God's going to deliver those who are following Jesus. Are you ready? Yes. Hallelujah. My second question to you today is this. Do we believe that we are a Christian nation? Hmm. It can make an interesting discussion. The pioneer settlers of America, the Puritans, the pilgrims, the separatists, they came to this land seeking basically religious freedom and persecution from the king and the Church of England. But folk, it was tough. And after a while, their primary objective of establishing a land of religious freedom was replaced by the objective to simply survive. So many, so many, so many of those first settlers died. We talk about that first Thanksgiving with the pilgrims. There was only just a handful of the original crew that made it. So many, so many of them died. The objective, the dream, drifted off. And for the next 100 years, the church influence, the Christian community in the settlers became lifeless, boring, and eventually almost did not exist. Then came what is called the First Great Awakening. That happened in 1740 in the next decade. And we started out with somebody like George Whitehead. George Whitehead started out in England. England at that particular time, the churches were splitting up, the churches were a mess, the churches were fighting against each other. And God raised up George Whitehead and he began to preach with fire and brimstone and joy and peace. He began to preach everything that needed to be preached. He was firing everybody up. And they tell me, I read this somewhere, that he preached 18,000 sermons to over 5 million people without a PA system. God blessed the man. They, I'm reading from history that God blessed the man with a loud voice when he talked, anybody could hear him, okay? So I, I, I accept that. 
But I began to figure up how, if he was preaching three times a week in that many sermons, that would be 70 years of preaching. And I know he only lived to be 76 years old. So he was preaching four or five times a week. And he reached five million people. He had to do that in Europe and in England because there weren't that many people here in the United States. But God moved him to the colonies, moved him to this country to preach to this nation. And as he began to preach, we have what we call the, the Great Awakening. The church came alive again. The people came back to God. And suddenly there's going a great revival. A great move of God had taken place. And wars and rumors of wars popped up. And as those wars began to, began to pop up, the conflict once again was between England and the colonies. England had decided she was going to take over the colonies and rule and reign along with the rest of the world. And as a result of that, it led to the American Revolution. Now, I know I'm giving you a little bit of a history lesson, but I want to show you something. The Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. I think I got that wrong, too. No, I, I got it right. got too many figures in my head right now. 1776, the Declaration of Independence was signed by 140 men, all with some form of Christian background, who put their life on the line, their neck on the chop block. Automatic death penalty from the King of England because they put their name on a piece of paper. How many of you put your name on a piece of paper for Jesus this morning? Amen. I want you to know something. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is going to take care of his people. Are we still together? Amen. Amen. Five times, the Declaration of Independence mentioned God. The Constitution of the United States came in 1787. It does not mention God at all with an exception of the closing statement in the year of our Lord, 1787. The whole idea there was it was not to make Christianity a state religion. But I'm asking you a question again this morning. Are we a Christian nation? Five times in the Declaration of Independence, God is mentioned. I like this. The course of common grace comes from God. God is the creator and sustainer of the world. God is the giver of certain rights. God is the supreme judge. God is our sovereign protector. In all of those statements, they wrote in there that God is the one that rules my life, not the government. Amen. Every one of those statements was a vote against the king and the state church running the country. Are we a Christian nation? Let me put it this way. Am I a Christian? And where I live, is it a Christian environment? And I'm going to tell you something. I believe there's enough Christians in this room to make Azel a Christian town. And I believe there's enough Christians. Come on, I'm telling you. I believe there's enough Christians in Azel to make Texas a Christian state. And I believe there's enough Christians in Texas to make this a Christian nation. And it's time for the body of Christ to stand up and let her voice be heard. Hallelujah. We must not back down. Now, my first question was this. Is our nation defined in Bible prophecy? Yes. Let me simplify it this way. 
When it refers in the, in the Old Testament, in the prophecies, when it refers to the young lions, it is, re, it is referring to the British Empire and the countries and colonies that were established by her. The United States is one of them. Canada is one of them. And you can go over into the Far East and find different ones. I'm not here to do a history lesson for you. But they're the young lions. When the rapture of the church takes place, how close are we to the rapture of the church? In my opinion, we're very, very close. Today, tomorrow, I still think we've got to wait for a harvest of souls. I believe that we're about to see a major, major move of God that the church has not seen in over 200 years. I believe that something is about to happen that's going to shake the entire world. And anybody who has any background or any connection to Christianity is going to know this is God. God's hand is going to be on it. And I'm excited about that. My question is going to come up again in a minute is, am I ready for that? I believe that God is choosing us. We are a chosen generation. I believe he is positioning us. Am I ready for what God wants to do next? Is my prayer life where it ought to be? Is my home life where it ought to be? All of these things are relevant right now. More than anything else. More than a job. More than going to the lake. More than a holiday, 4th of July or stuff like that. Right now, we're, on a, we're in a, a moment. And I'm excited about what God is about to do in that particular moment. Now, our kids are getting ready to go to youth camp, so you see them moving around. That's what's happening here. They'll be leaving here in a few minutes and be back on Wednesday. They promise to keep us posted on all the hallelujahs that take place down there. So keep them in prayer. They're gone, okay? Now, when the rapture of the church takes place, there is no need for the United States to exist. Hello? Will there be a nation here? I believe there will be something here. But keep in mind that once the church is out of here, all chaos breaks loose. The Antichrist is on the scene somewhere in my opinion. I believe he's a grown man. That's how close I believe we are. He will be able to pull all the nations together. How will he manage to do that? When you talk about Russia, China, North Korea, what they stand for and what we, the United States, stand for. What's the common denominator? that would pull all those nations together, it's not going to be God. It's going to be money, the economy. And the Antichrist, if you study the book of Revelation with us, you will find he uses the economy to pull the people together and to make himself the Christ, the deliverer, the savior of the world. And for three and a half years, it'll look like it's working. And then God will have the last word. Are you still with me? So I come to my final question. My final question is this. How do you define yourself today? The question number one was, is our nation defined in Bible prophecy? Yes. Question number two, do we define ourselves as a Christian nation? It's an individual thing. So question number three, since it's an individual thing, how do I define myself? Do I define myself as a Christian? By whose definition? I've often been confronted with people asking them, are you a Christian? They say, I'm, a, I'm Baptist, I'm Catholic. Um, that's a denomination. I didn't ask you if you belonged to a denomination. I wanted to know if you were a Christian. And then they would say something like this. Well, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I've been baptized. That was not my question. 
My question is, are you a Christian? And they said, well, what do you mean? In Antioch, they were first called Christians because they were like Christ. How many of you are like Jesus Christ? If you are like Christ, the anointed one with the anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage, then you, my friend, have victory today, this very moment, over anything and everything the world or the devil tries to throw at you. And your God and my God will fire back. Mm, your God and my God will fight our battle for us, and he has already won the victory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. How do you find, define yourself? This all started before Israel was born through Abraham. It started with Adam. Adam messed up. But God dealt with mankind through the revelation that Adam had in man's conscious mind, will, and emotions. It lasted until Noah's flood. Now I want you to understand something. Methuselah lived 969 years. When Methuselah was born, Adam was still living. Adam was the communicator between God and mankind through that entire period. And everything that Adam knew about God, everything Adam had experienced with God, had been relayed to his descendants. So that when Noah came on the scene over a thousand years later, the message of God could be handed directly to, Mo to Noah. But man's conscience became violated by sin and iniquity. And he became so wicked that God had to start all over. God found Noah. And Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Do you know what that means? For by grace are we saved through faith. Amen. Grace means unearned, undeserved favor. God looked through the human race and he found a fellow. Was Noah a goody two shoe? No. But he had enough of Adam's teachings and Methuselah's teachings and Enoch's teachings. God said, Noah, you're my man. You know what the key was to that grace? Obedience. Obedience. Build me an ark. Build me a boat that's three stories tall. Some say 40 feet wide, 70 feet long. I don't know. I just know it had three floors. Johnny can tell you more about it. B.B. back there can tell you more about it than I can. They just got back from seeing Noah's Ark in Kentucky or wherever it is. They're not paying a word of attention to me. Now they are, okay. If you want to know anything about Noah's Ark, they're the ones to talk to. But my thing is this. It had three floors. The door was on the second floor. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I am the door. And I want you to know, Jesus is the door of salvation. 
Here's the door to the safety ark, the good old gospel ship that's going to get us into heaven. Are you still with me? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, having said that, 400 years after the flood, God met up with a fellow named Abraham, made a covenant with him, and birthed the nation of Israel from his loins. And in that covenant, he made a prophetic statement that we refer to as 70 weeks. But then God put Israel on hold. And we find it in the book of Daniel. Israel is on hold after completing 69 weeks. She's got one more week to go. In between is you and me. What's happening, folk? God the Father is coming to take his son's bride home. Are we ready? Amen. Hallelujah. Is there anything you need to do today to make sure that you're ready? So I asked the question, are you ready? How do you define yourself as a Christian? How do you define yourself in your relationship to God? How do you define yourself in your relationship to your church? How do you feel about your security, your financial security, your eternal security? Folks, we struggle with so many day-to-day -day activities. What we're going to eat for supper? Got to stop at the gas station and gas up. It's going to cost me $50 to fill up the tank. You understand what I'm saying? We deal with all these things. In the meanwhile, I read to you from Psalms, Emmanuel, God's with you right now. God knows what you're facing. God knows what you need to get from here to tomorrow. And he told you, don't even think about tomorrow. Dwell in my presence. I'll take care of your tomorrows. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a praise. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Stand with me all over the room. Put your hand on your heart. And let's pray. Father God, I come to you today as an under-shepherd. Lord, I have lifted my voice to this people and declared what you laid on my heart. Lord, I believe something big is coming this way. And Lord, I declare the Victory Christian Center is ready. I thank you, Lord, that it's not our perfection that you're looking for, but it's our availability and our obedience. I thank you, Lord, that we find grace in your sight. I declare in Jesus' name for this fellowship to be healed and made whole, spirit, soul, and body. If you need a healing in your body right now, I want you to call it done by the stripes on Jesus' back. He paid for your healing. It's a done deal in his eyes. Let's call it done in our eyes. In the name of Jesus, I am healed. Thank you, Lord, for my healing. In the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. There are those under the sound of my voice that's been battling with hurt, rejection, anger, the mind, the will, the emotions, so often are in conflict. My Bible says I have what I say, so I say to you in Jesus' name, I want you to take a healing in your mind, take a healing in your emotions. Take a healing in your will. No rebellion, no anger, no unforgiveness. 
I speak in Jesus' name. There's healing in the house this morning. Mind, will, and emotions. There's a spiritual healing too. Mankind separated from God. Jesus made a way for us to come back to God. How do you see yourself this morning? In the eyes of God, how do you see yourself this morning? In your salvation. No one looking around except me and the Holy Spirit. How many of you would lift your hand and say, spiritually, I know I'm ready for whatever God brings my way. Put your hand up right now. Put the other hand up and say, thank you, Lord. I call it done. I receive it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If your hand's not up, I tell you right now, the peace of God is yours. The peace of God is yours. We're calling it done right now. I'm blessed according to the word. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I want to be near you. Lord, I want to see your face. I want to be in your intimate mercy. Lord, I want to be like you. No one can. Shout to all the people Be healed in Jesus' name Be healed from all